Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my good buddy, Paul Barron. And today we're bringing you a super fun guest, somebody that we've been fans of for many, many years. He's been one of the most sought after trumpet performers and educators for, for decades. Uh, since he graduated from Eastman School of Music, Professor DiMartino has taught at the University of Kentucky. And uh, after that, he's gone on to do all sorts of teaching, all sorts of clinics uh, across the world and across the nation. Uh, he's one of, the, one of the trumpeters that is equally adept both in the classical and jazz realms. He's been lead and solo trumpet uh, for Lionel Hampton's big band, Chuck Mangione's band, the great Clark Terry big band, and many, many others. His list goes on a mile long. He's been a uh, guest artist with a lot of uh, many, many orchestras and bands. Uh, I just personally listened to this uh, Rhapsody by Tull that he recorded many years ago that is absolutely astounding. And he's been featured on some of the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra's uh, uh, recordings. Uh, including the uh, Mancini's great, Greatest Hits and Bond and Beyond and all sorts of things. He also recorded uh, with Mel Torme on the Christmas album as lead trumpet. And uh, he's completed uh, several recording projects, I think also on Summit Records. And I know I've, I have one with uh, where he performs both with uh, uh, Alan Vizzuti and Bobby Shu. Uh, which is called Trumpet Summit, and uh, he's done so much. Uh, we'll be an hour just talking about all of all of your credits. Uh, so, and lastly, I just want to say that uh, he's also a Picket Blackburn performing artist. So, welcome, Vince DiMartino. Thanks for taking the time to be here with us today. Thanks, guys. It's really great to be here. It's great to be talking to two trumpet people and about the things we love so much. <laughs> And so we can all share in the pain together. <laughs> yeah, your book is great, Paul. Oh, thank you very much. Hey, well, um, one of the things that was really interesting to us and, you know, uh, Bobby and you and I were talking right before we hit record button um, about body mechanics. And you recently put up a, uh, a short video talking about um, how music is cerebral. And uh, can you just talk more about that? Because that was really fascinating to both of us. Yeah. Well, one of the things we have to remember, I think I have to remember it every day because, you know, our habits over of 50 years or more of, of playing the trumpet, 60 for me, uh, you know, you, you're always trying to suppress the stuff that you started with because it's still there, you know. So I, I'm always reminding myself that the music is here. It's not in there. So so that the model all the musical knowledge there's, there's a lot of people that, that that have the mechanics down you know way better than i do and and uh but sometimes you know it gets lost in that because that's the part that's the most uh present in their mind is you know getting one note higher or being able to play this note in tune and those are all great creditable things <laughs> but at the same time you know that, that everything has to emanate from within so the music has to be there and of course that means we have to have a great amount of knowledge and files we have to have files up there that's why that's why you know the trumpet when we play a trumpet it's the, the same lips the same air uh in most cases the same horn uh and so the the only difference is the style of the music the the uh, the landscape so so basically that's what we sort out in here but we have to have all of that that physical knowledge most people like uh, classical players will sometimes they'll say I, I can't play jazz at all and i say well how how much do you do it a day do you do it two hours three hours oh no you know, like we get something in the orchestra and then I have to play it, you know, I said, well, you know, that's you shouldn't expect to be really good at it. You know, how much do you listen? I always say uh, whatever, however much you practice in a day, you should listen the same amount of hours. So if you're going to err on the practicing side, you, uh, you you err on the practicing physical practicing and you load up on the mental. 
because that has to be the the knowledge base. So when you sit down in a show, like today, Paul is playing in a show, he's playing in Frozen, and I mean, who knows what every line brings? He knows now because he's played it so much, but when you first start, so, well, this is supposed to be sound like this. This is supposed to sound like that because he has the knowledge base. But some sub might come in and play it. And, you know, I don't know if this has happened, but, you know, they'll come in, uh, you come back after a week of, you know, for some reason being off. Somebody says, yeah, that guy was really good, but boy, he didn't know what, know what anything was supposed to sound like. Yeah, you see, and that's, of course, that's the, the difference. So the knowledge base is always the thing to feed the most. And that's not going to make you sound great. Because then what follows is the physical practice and the, the physical machinery that allows you to play the trumpet well and, and the equipment. I mean, really, you know, uh, I use sometimes in a recital, like I, when I recorded pictures at an exhibition with organ, okay, I used six horns in rapid, you know, like was, I couldn't do it. The first, the first time I tried to play the piece, I just missed every entrance because I had never done that, you know? And so I, I set all the horns up every day and I pick up a different one and just play it. Or and I play the transitions from one to the next and I set all the horns up right. So finally, I got to the point where I could just pick it up or have one in one hand, put it down real quick, pick up this one and play the next thing I had to play. And, you know, that's that's just that's practice. That's mechanical. That's a mechanical skill. And, and then you also have the, the, uh, the balance, which which for me, I like all my balances to feel fairly similar. Piccolo maybe is a little little different, but everything to feel similar. So when I pick it up, I don't have a moment of uh, distraction. <laughs> And then just to be clear, Vince, when you're saying uh, the balance or the, the you're talking about the feel, the resistance, the, the yes. from moving from horn to horn, you like to try to keep that yeah. feel and that makes total sense. Yeah. So how do you how do you do that when you're when you're talking about these, say, a few different horns like that? Well, uh, how do you use different equipment? That? I have the mouthpieces set up when well, I do a lot of horns. You know, usually if it's just a C trumpet and a B flat, I got one mouthpiece, I throw it in the other one and I play the brass quintet gig or whatever I'm doing. But if it's something like a real uh, complex, you know, combination of instruments, because the, the pictures at an exhibition is 13 minutes straight of different horns, different mutes, different everything. And it's a whole piece, you know, so it's it's all these different colors and sounds. So what I did was I, I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, making sure that the, the balance of the mouthpiece, the blow, the balance of the blow was similar. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in so many ways. We could talk about that for a week. But yeah. Mainly it's the balance between the way you blow, the way you want to blow normally to make it feel so that you can change easily. Otherwise, you're making an adjustment every horn for a few bars. And that's that's dangerous to me <laughs> so so i do that and then you can do that with this, the 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 whole size the back bore and the venturi of the of the lead pipe and you know mostly you can do it with the hole in the back bore so you don't have to mess with a lot of stuff you know but i do it because uh, most of my some of my horns are antique and i don't mess with the horn at all i just do the best i can with the, the mouthpiece set up and and i get special mouthpieces made to get the period sound so they all have the same rim that helps me too right and my piccolo has the same rim and so it's a way of not having to change your your body and your compression right yeah it's a way of not being distracted sure so so when you go through the routine of uh, uh preparing a performance uh you're preparing that as well you're getting confidence in in moving from section to section of the piece or volume to volume, or whatever whatever we do, and I practice. I practice when I'm practicing these days. Uh, I have to practice more with a play along sometimes because uh, I need to practice more than I used to 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 do that. I don't hear as well. I you know, get, make sure I'm playing the right volume. So I have the speakers. I have big speakers. 
that I turn up. And so I feel like I'm in the in the ensemble. So all of these things, I mean, there's that's why the basic fundamental things of, of being a good a trumpet uh, mechanics, good trumpet balance, good trumpet control, so you can execute the ideas that are in your head uh, uh, more catalytically. It happens faster. You know what I mean? Because some people practice the same thing over and over again, and they expect it to change, and it doesn't. It gets better at being the same. So, you know, and, and we know that because we have, we've all had students that they come to a lesson, they do really, really well, and they come out of the lesson and they're feeling just great. The next week they come back and they say, you know, you know, after a couple of days, I just didn't feel good. I, I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. Well, see, they haven't incorporated the most important part of the lesson is that you practiced for them. They're not incorporating. That's the most important part of the lesson. I know teachers that are just good players that have the most fantastic students. You know, and I know and a lot of times I can say, oh, you studied with Gene Moorhead, didn't you? Right. How did you know that? I said, well, you sound like somebody who studied with her. She's a fantastic teacher. She does the same types of things with people. I hear what she says in what you play. Ah, I don't see how you do that. See, because she she finds a way to instill that practice ethic. She makes them understand somehow that what she's saying is is what they have to think about when they come across that problem or this type of piece or this speed thing or this or whatever endurance or breathing or yeah, she, she practices for for an hour with them. You know, I, I played when I taught. I was more tired at the end of the day than any student was because <laughs> you're I, playing I, with all of them. I play with all of them. I play probably 15 to 20 minutes out of every lesson. And I'd play it, I'd say, because because I, I wanted him to know, first of all, when I got to the University of Kentucky, I, I really couldn't even play through a characteristic study without stopping. Not really, you know, I sort of could, but I, I realized that I said, you know, this has to be everybody's goal. So so I started a rule. I said, you, you everybody had to play a characteristic study starting the very first week, because this is mechanics. We're talking about mechanics. We're talking about concentration. We're talking about all the things that are necessary to to enable this, which has been growing for years and years and years and working much faster than this. You know, much more efficiently. So we're trying to play catch up. So we have to figure out something. So so the first semester of teaching is discipline training which tries to bring that trumpet playing higher and higher with the music, musical strength and it included listening. Uh, I mean, there it's, I think I sent a copy of the whole life with trumpet folder. You did. Yeah, it's great. Well, well, look at it and look at the, look at the, uh, the syllabus one called, it's called revised syllabus or revised. Syllabus. I just looked at that this morning. As a matter of fact, it's very, it's very uh, scary for freshmen to look at because there's eight things they have to do every week and get tested on every two weeks. And it's more of a discipline training, teaching them how to move on and to keep to keep pressing forward, developing a methodology that's bringing, you know, people who can only play three or four scales. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, they play the trumpet OK, but they can't play anything on it. So. So it's 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 sort of a, a thing that, that I can identify all the the things that need to be put into perspective. And uh, it really worked. It still works. It doesn't matter what's in the boxes in that thing. It just matters that there's something in there and they have to complete it in two weeks and get tested and they move on to the next thing. That's now, it end. sounds like a way that you're teaching them to also be in tune with their own uh, needs and, and how they progress and work, right? Exactly. It, it actually just points up like, and you know, like what, when you have a syllabus like that, instead of being here, teacher, student, you're here, teacher and student on the same side of the stand, you see, and that's a whole different mental perspective. So 
what I'm trying to do is get the teach the student to be the teacher when I'm not there to take my place. You see, so therefore they're they're uh, the ones and, and many I, I mean, the percentage of people that have done real well with this is way better than 50 percent. Way better, you know, people like Al Hood, Brad Good, you know, I mean, just uh, Ken Titmus. I don't know if you heard Ken Titmus play. I haven't heard him play, but I know who he is. Sure. I used to say, Ken, you know, Ken is OK. All right. I'd say, play high, hey, Ken. And you just go. <laughs> like, you know, like Mr. Mild Miltoast. But that's the point. These people gain confidence in their knowledge, not my knowledge. My knowledge is of no use to them. One of the things that we talk about in our approach is that, you know, we're like we were talking about earlier, we are very non-dogmatic because some people get really hung up. Like I'm a stamp student personally, you know, and I studied also with Great stuff. for many years and there's such a distinct way, but you have to find your own way. And there's a lot of tools out there to experiment with so that you can learn. The problem is that there's is also there's a lot of bad information out there as well. But I do think that one of the most important things is to try to figure out what works for you, because just because this worked for this person or that person doesn't mean mm -hmm. it's going to work for you. If you look at the very first page of that book of mine, um, it says this this book is written not to dispel what others say, but to bring it together to make it clear because terminology is is one of the worst things about learning a trumpet or anything. You know, like you ever get one of those IKEA things, you know? Yeah. You're lucky to be able to put the screw in, <laughs> let alone figure out which part goes together, you know? So it, things that don't come with instructions. Every everything in that book there, the first part is all words. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get a little water here. But uh then it moves on to exercises, which never moves away from the simplicity of the beginning. You never lose the simplicity of the beginning. Just those all methods. If you do stamp, you're doing with the piano and the mouthpiece and you're doing all the different types of pedal notes and everything else. I couldn't play a pedal note till about, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I was playing six trumpet 60 years, you know, I was, I was going, you know, <laughs> you know, I was going, hell, I, nobody can, I don't know how to say anybody, a flugelhorn mouthpiece, that'll do it, you know. But then I started to experiment with, instead of difference, sameness. So like, for instance, the first thing I do now, especially, I usually do it once or twice a week because I'm usually in better condition than this. I play my first note of the day. Now, see, it's getting got pretty seamless there. That's what I want. Now, that's the note I play all day. See, so now the limitation, I've, I've warmed up the, the preliminary thing. The only action in trumpet playing is air because it's the emanation point of making this work. It has to be. Everything else is a reaction to that air. So whether you're manipulating it a little differently in your mouth, that's fine. But if it doesn't come up and in, and through the oral cavity, and enter the oral cavity the same way, everything you do after that is moot point. It's not going to work. So right. that's like the days, the times when I, I, this is one of my favorite licks. I used to call it, we used to call it, that. one of my students is a great, great trumpet player. And we used to call him Mr. Three and Out. He used to go, He'd hit it three times, like to try to get the note. You know what I mean? And and he had just played a beautiful G before that, but as soon as he played C, he just dropped his air support. And of course, now he had to rega regain and guess where the next note was. But if you're always playing G, see. 
excuse the same. Yeah. This is, this is one case where I teach students and I've had like on a master classes, even I've had students come up and they just take their horn down and they can't believe that they just did that. You know, because you do it with, a, uh, you can read about it, but you tap on somebody's shoulder when they can't see. And they have to do that exercise, hitting that little grace note and immediately going back to the G. So they have to find a way to do that. And we're good at doing that. We're good at trying things as long as we, and, and, you, and they can't know. See, so you're back there and you're going, oh. And you do it at all different times. See, then once they do that, they go, what? They got almost all those top notes. And it didn't, it wasn't any effort because they were playing one note. They were supporting. Support is inversely proportional to how much air you have left. Period. It has to be that way. We know that because if you take a balloon, right, and you blow it up, you got your balloon, get, get it out, get your balloon out. You don't have, where is it? I have mine. Do you see it? All right. There you go. Uh, <laughs> ready? So we blow it up. And we hold the end. Now, if we want to play the same pitch without touching the balloon, the only thing you can do is force the the front to get t more and more tense, flatter and flatter here if possible, and the pitch changes and the tone suffers and eventually it just stops or it's, you explode, <laughs> either one, okay? But the reality of it is you don't have to do that. All you have to do is add your arms. That's your support. So you take the balloon, you blow it up, you hold it, you don't do anything here. You just move your arms against the balloon and the pitch will stay steady. Now, if you get louder, you tighten your lips a little bit so they don't blow apart too much. You see, if you get softer, you loosen up a little bit. So and if you want to play the same volume, you only loosen and tighten up to keep them the same, the same aperture size. Paul has an unbelievable aperture. I mean, he has aperture control that's unreal. I mean, you know, you it, and that's and and some people do it intuitively. You know what I mean? It, it makes sense because of something we don't know, you know. And it's also practiced. It's a practiced thing. And when you get to a certain point and you realize, you know, when I played the Fisher Tull Concerto and recorded that, uh, I I was coming up to the the edge of what I could do, you know? And and so I said, well, now you're gonna have to do some real serious, uh, real practicing, you know? So I did, and I started to realize all these things. That's when I started to really write that book because I realized that it was important to write it down. So people could, in, in a language that, that somebody who's not the brightest light on the block can understand like me. <laughs> I want somebody who lives in Viper, Kentucky be able to read that book and learn to play the trumpet. Because I mean, look at it. I mean, really, this thing is what? It's it's primitive. So we, we really should we really should think much simpler in terms yeah. and, and all of the a lot of methods, you know, that people talk about think beautiful things and beautiful things will come out. That's that's true to some degree, you know, and, and up to a certain <clears throat> point. And then all of a sudden you realize that there, that has its limitations too. And, and so we have to come up with something. So for me, it was this inverse proportion. So therefore, now there's only, there's one less variable. Now that variable is very important because it is the control variable. The air and it's, it's constants that makes this machine run just like a fine car. You know, a fuel pump and in the old days and fuel injection now and and uh, all these electronics that they have they still can't substitute they're just electronic for the same processes and we balance them up so basically you have a recipe to play it's physical it's not it's not musical you know you cannot if you play and you put the air in your mouth how do you get it to go in this little hole that's what i want to know yeah what the old trumpet players talked about words, they used words, 
with air. Air what? Air. When they talk about support. speed, air speed, air stands up, holds up the Parthenon. Column. Air column. Okay. Catch fish in it. Wave. Air stream. Stream. Okay. <laughs> air flow. Chickawitz. Air. See what I mean? They they have words. This is where terminology becomes. They never said air cave. I never heard anybody say air cave. <laughs> you know. So some people play with. They say you know play in the inside here. Well, you've completely destroyed all the compression of your air. And now you're trying to get it to go in this little hole. So what do you do? You press harder you squeeze your lips real hard and get G on top of the staff, maybe. You see, so basically we have to teach how to, how to create a vortex. Because the trumpet is run by a vortex. Everybody's mouth is different inside and all that. We don't have to talk about that. But if I get a sheet of paper here. <laughs> out of my trusty printer there it is okay so a vortex is basically a tornado all right so it's not that big in the back uh, of us our mouths so we want to make it a little smaller than that you know probably much smaller than this but see so as you go towards the front it has to get smaller and smaller, not bigger and bigger in here. And that's one of the biggest, I think, things that is is a thing that needs to people need to think rethink. OK, and and so basically what's going through your mouth then and how do we do it? I teach people to whistle. Can you whistle? That's good enough. That's good enough whistling. Then I have them blow on the mouthpiece sometimes. Do it backwards. You know, whatever whatever works. Uh, uh, Wayne Bergeron had me do a thing for the muscles because right now my muscles are like, you know. And it also stops you from blowing too hard hmm. because otherwise your your eyes start to pop <laughs> so i thought that was a really good exercise wayne taught me yeah oh that, that's a great exercise yeah and i i heard a little air you know yeah and i did that on purpose because then you're not as you said blowing your eyes out of your yeah skull. and i let yeah and when i when i do that i let a little air out and then i back off and then i keep my corner this is even firmer so this way i'm getting even more efficient and then I have that much that adds a little more parameter if I do want to do that, if I need to do it. And that also increases your range because because that means that that, you know, the tongue never. The only time that uh, I ever play with a with a tongue not touching my top teeth is when I play a pedal note because I want the air to slow down that much. So let me take my other mouthpieces. I use the little one to, to get the pedal note the, the first of the day, you know, because I want it to be more efficient. So I keep my lips in, out of the mouthpiece. See, so my aperture is really not big. If it was, I wouldn't be able to play that note that long. See, so there's lots of, they're all mechanical. These are all postulates. These are all like from geometry. They're not from, you know, trumpet something. You know, they're all basic. See, so when I play, I learned to play a pedal C the most odd way. I was practicing like something like the Fisher Tall, and I missed the top of the note. You know, it was just like, you know, it was like a fireworks display. You know, <laughs> six notes came out, and I just and I and I and I went like you know. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this pedal C came out. And I said, "Oh my God, that was a pedal C." 
And I said, okay, stop. What is it that you do on the high notes that you haven't been doing on pedal C? First of all, you keep your lips as the same read. Ah, oh, I've been going, <laughs> I've been playing like tuba. Right. So you, you, can't, you can't play a real pedal note. I mean, you can play those fake ones, but that, I don't think they really do as much for you. You know, they do a lot for the circulation and stuff like that, but you know. What's the other thing? I do this a lot with students. I'll show you. They play like a low C. I say, don't play low C. Just keep holding it. I say, how come I can move your mouthpiece? They go, well, it's low. I said, well, does a clarinet player loosen up the ligature when they, when they play a low note on a clarinet? It's a reed. It has the same tensile strength. That's what makes it have the same tone. That's what makes them able to play really softly. And we, we usually can't as soft as they can. So let's forget about the trumpet and think about how something like a clarinet has the same range as a really fantastic trumpet player. Low E for them, low F sharp for us to double high C and they can even go above that. And so, I mean, I have, there's a trumpet player in Florida, his, his, his name is uh, uh, Jeff uh, Woodbri Wood Wooldridge. I mean, this guy, he sounds like Wayne Bergeron. He plays the whole tune and he just stops and plays double high Ds at the end of the tune. And it sounds fantastic. And if you watch him, he looks the same. Wow. I mean, he, and, and I mean, he's a little more red because he's creating more compression, but the, everything is, is working the same way. So, so endurance, endurance goes along with this and it has to do with mechanics and endurance going along with this is endurance is not strength. It's what it costs to move from note to note. See, so in Very other words, yeah, a lot of people think it's all about just brute strength. Well, we know. Well, look at once again, we don't have to have people believe us. All they have to do is study what they see. There's trumpet players that can play high G's for, you know, two lines and then they can't play. So does that mean they have good endurance? No, it means that they figured out how to play high G and they have no endurance. Yeah. You well, see, and it gets, it gets kind of to the point you're talking about where you, we're trying to keep our embouchure in this kind of median position, not yeah. opening it really wide or pinching it off. And when you start yeah. to do that, you're creating all this excess muscle uh, movement. And that's cost. You know, yeah, that's cost. it's total cost. Look, that's Paul Barron, man, he plays tons of gigs. All right. He's always got a thousand bucks in his pocket. <laughs> you know, he's, doing, he's doing great. Vince, you know, I live in a small town. I volunteer. I might make 75 bucks a month playing in town. But if it costs Paul $10 a note to get from note to note, he's got a hundred notes. If it costs me, you know, 50 cents, I got 150 notes. You see what I mean? Yeah. Especially I, factoring inflation. Yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, but you see, my point is, is that it's it's a it's a it's a false uh, kind of a concept. If there is degree of strength, I mean, you have to be able to maintain. So that's that's strength to some degree, but it's not strength to change notes. You you change your embouchure to make it work the same. So that the response is the same, you know, the difference we can, and in doing these mechanics, we can, let's, let's do the three pairs of things. Okay. There's only three things you can do in music. It's great. Vince wouldn't be able to play music if he had done no more than that. You can go what? Slower and faster, faster, faster. higher, lower, lower, louder and softer. Yeah. And, and the permutations and combinations thereof. Now that takes a lot of time, that in itself. But if you're doing the first, if you're doing all those three things wrong, it doesn't matter what you're practicing. It's just not gonna be possible. So basically, 
what's the difference between, let's see, loud and soft? It has to be the amount of air because we can only, we can hold the soft note much longer than we can hold a loud note. So the air is leaving the body. And if you read Keith Johnson's book, he says, uh, loud is faster air. And, and I talked to him one time about it because I said, well, you know, Keith, I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you know, you're expelling air. I said, okay, that's right. I, I get it. See, he means the air is leaving your body faster. It isn't faster in speed. Right. You're losing the air. So that, there's, there's one of those misconceptions that Between people speed have. and velocity and... Um, yeah, velocity and just exhalation yeah. at a more rapid pace, you know. And so we know that that's correct because the physiology of the body tells you that. You can't change that physiology. So, and we build up our breath. And we, you know, I'm lately, as I get older, I'm practicing breathing with the breathing tube and I'm doing all the things I've always told people to do. And I never really did much of myself because I didn't feel like I needed to, you know, I mean, I just worked it out somehow. I was doing those things, but I didn't use any devices or anything. I don't know what I was doing. But so therefore, that's, that's a simple one. We got that one. So we got that right. We can put that in the rack there to be start to be used. What's the difference between fast and slow? Until I get all the patterns. See, because that's also, this is a very uh, efficient exercises. There are combinations of uh, intervals so that when you see a piece, something on a piece of music, that enables you to sight read it because you've already heard that pattern. You see, so it, it's a combination of sight reading. I think I'm going to write a, a series of duets based on an exercise. So, based on that exercise, and you do it in all, you can do it in any key. I mean, you can start on any note. It's really, it's really depressing, but it, but it, but it's very effective for the ear because the ear is what makes these move and, and makes a move at the speed that you need to. And anyway, so therefore the only difference is if each note is an event, the events are close together. And I got better at it as I went along. I picked one that had the hard, this fingering, cause I suck at that one, you know, <laughs> And, and I do different ones every day. I do like three keys of that. It's all in the book. You can look at it all. And, and uh, then the last one, what's the difference between high and low? Okay, and then and we're gonna we'll incorporate some stuff. So basically, when you go higher, it's, it's sort of similar to louder. It's related to louder because we do cr create more compression, but, uh, we don't allow the, the size of the aperture to change unless the, unless the phrase gets louder too. But, but so basically, see most people, when they try to go higher, they get. See, they, they just, they let the air spread their lips apart. And of course the air just slows down and either you crack down to the next lowest note right. or you get that distorted awful sound. So we have to practice the coordination exercises. That's why I use that G on top of the staff because it gets the air set. And if people start making that their habit, all these flexibility things will start to grow really fast and the range will increase the sound uh, similarity, the consistency of the sound throughout the registers will be the same. And then you're playing music because you're not distracted by the trumpet. I mean, I, you know, when you go to a recital, I, there's nothing worse than going to a recital and the person starts playing the first page of music and you go, oh, my God, they're not going to get through this piece either. Have you heard me play? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's it's you know it. I mean, we have that sensation. We know a lot about what people are feeling. We've gone through it to some degree in every way. So so basically, I just I just I put them in trumpet jail. I call it trumpet jail. I said, you don't stay in trumpet jail. You don't get out until you can do these things. You're expecting to, 
just do the same thing over and over again and it's supposed to get better? No, you get great at being bad at it. You know, I said, you have to change. It's, it's scientific method. You, you eliminate the stuff that doesn't work as soon as possible and you alter it to some degree. You know, instead of putting in one ounce, you put an ounce and a half in. And then you see if that explodes in your face. You know? <laughs> yeah, and that's what we do when we practice. It's not repetitions. That's, that's one of the things that's wrong, you know, the assignment thing. is like they just try to complete the assignment. And, and that's a discipline training. That's part of it. But the really important part is that we really work on the same thing every week. Only they're using different materials and they're not bored. They don't slow down. They don't get uh, dulled. They don't stop listening to music. They're required to listen to music uh, because they have to listen to the little excerpts I have in there that they have to play out of Phil Collins' uh, uh, In the Singing Style book. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a great book. It has all kinds of everything from, you know, old hymn tunes to, to and, and all of his new books too, the ones that are like uh, symphony books, you know, pops books and all those things are, are just great. You know, I think that the, the, the gig specific things and like Paul's working book and all these books are really great. Uh, and they, and I, I personally don't care if anybody learns any classical music or jazz music or anything. I don't really care. I want them to learn the trumpet so that they can, they can, uh, be competitive in the future market, teaching wise, performing wise. Wait, I, I always ask somebody. I say, you know, uh, well, you know, why do I have to practice? Okay, can you tell me what music you're going to be playing 15 years from now? What it's going to sound like, and what part the trumpet is going to have in it, if any. I said that's why you practice the trumpet. I said the trumpet players that have been playing for 50 years and working steadily, there's a reason for it. They don't just go in there and suck on the stuff. Their trumpet playing is always ready for the next challenge. We never know instance, what's gonna be put in front of us, right? That's right, it's either, it's either bored to death or scared to death. Lou Soloff, I'll quote Lou Soloff on that. I heard him say one day, somebody asked, well, what's, Lou, uh, what's it like to play in the studios? He said, well, most of the time you're bored to death and he said the rest of the time you're scared to death. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, and you know, you go in there and you know, you're playing footballs for, you know, two hours and go home, you get a nice check and nothing's happening. It was easy. You warmed up, you know, you really used the gig to do some things. And, and then the next time you come in and you're playing Charlie Mingus music, you know? Yeah. And, and, and you're going, oh my God, I have to play this in 15 minutes for this rehearsal. You know, and, and then you play it and then you practice it every minute between then and the gig, just trying to get the intervals in your ear and figure out who you're playing with or if you're supposed to be playing at all, you know, and, and so that's why that's why the this part of trumpet playing is so important. Because it's not really music related at all. Trumpet playing is not musical. There is no such thing as musical trumpet playing. And, there's, and there's, there's a musical this... representation of this musical instrumentation, this musical instrument, there's there's the relationship flows through that because you can't hear what somebody's thinking. So for me, that's the way I practice every day. So, you know, if I'm playing, somebody says, you know, you know, I'm, I, I just turn the record on. You know, and I'd, fit, I'd make my adjustments and I'd go, you know, or if it's, you know, like. Oh, boy. See, I mean, it, it's just there. And now my trumpet's getting, you know, another, another minute or two, I'll probably be in pretty good shape. But, but, but I just play, I don't, you got to be in the halfway house all the time. You, you can't, you know, hope that you can get to warm up. I mean, you, you play the Brandenburg half the time. I played it about, I don't know, 25 times, probably at least. And when you play that piece, you know, everybody's worried about it. I said, well, hell, it's only seven minutes long. And if you got those, don't worry about it. 
But the thing is, you're sitting back there like this. <laughs> They're playing the first piece, you know. They don't want to ever play the Brandenburg first. They want to do it at the end of the first half. Because it's, you know, if the trumpet player does great, the audience goes crazy. So, you know, you're sitting back there, and it's like in an old uh, vaudeville house. There's no backstage. There's no dressing rooms. You can't make a noise, really. They're playing a Mozart overture or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so you're just sitting back there. Okay. Well, let's see, they're in G now. Okay, good. Okay. You know, that's about it. You play a few notes and then you go out there and you take a bow and they tune and you go. So, I, you know, I think that's really a good practice habit. You know, and a lot of people do the practicing thing. There was a guy, what's his name? Uh, William Leathers, that new young guy. Have you seen him? No. He's really good. He just became a first trumpet in the Dallas, Sym Dallas Symphony and uh, also in the uh, Santa Fe Opera Orchestra, I believe. And he just goes. stuff like that he does over and over and he has like a whole routine he does it in all these keys and stuff because it's what he has to do on his job you know so it, people there's a combination of we call fundamentals but then there's uh, another aspect of that which is specific fundamentals that have to do with your job sure if you're in a symphony you're going to be doing stuff phil collins man we went to school together. We we're the same age. We played in the same groups. He used to do that. He played the same note over and over. And he'd do that for like, you know, three or four minutes. And then, I mean, just, I didn't even know what he was doing at the time. You know, I was, I never taken lessons. I didn't know anything. I just go, man, that's a strange exercise. You know, it just didn't make any sense to me. I played by ear. I, you know, I just, I somehow got an Eastman. I don't know how I got in there, but, but, you know, it was just a, it was a great experience because I had all these colleagues that did all these really interesting things that I didn't understand. You know, they thought I was played great, you know, cause I could play a few high notes and I'd sound a good in jazz band and, you know, and stuff like that, but I couldn't really do anything. So I, but I, but I had all these colleagues that could do stuff and I'd say, you know, Marvin, Chap Chappie Perry in uh, Indianapolis, I'd say, How do you, man, you you come in soft on a low G and I can't even bl play below a low A. How do you do that? Well, my teacher down in Birmingham <laughs> showed me this and you know what? I got better. I still wasn't really good, but I was better. And now I'm starting to really sound good in the low register. You know, it's, it's, it's just... Uh, I think it's having an open mind, not closing off any uh, doors. You know, if you if you close a door, you've closed an opportunity. 